Thank you guys for joining me on YouTube, or if you're watching the website, my name is Nathan, and I have the joy and the privilege of serving as the lead pastor at City Lines Church. And today we're kicking a real feel-good series for July. You know, we are going to be talking about lament. Who's excited about lament? <laughs> I'm kidding. Listen, I know some of you are thinking, Pastor Nathan, come on, it's summertime. People are at cookouts. It's July 4th weekend. We want to talk about fun and parties and things like that. Why are we talking about lament? Lament is lame, dude. And listen, I get it, right? Because like most Americans, uh, if you're like me, we hate talking about dark, negative, or difficult things. We, we don't even want to go there. We'd much rather focus on the good things, right? Positive things. We want to always be moving up and to the right, right? To quote one of my favorite movies, the Lego movie, everything is awesome, right? <laughs> It'd be great if things would just stay that way, where everything is good, great all the time. The reality is, um, when we watch the news, we're reminded about war, social unrest, racial unrest, inequality, injustice. It happens all around us, and we could tune those things out with a, a good old pint of Ben and Jerry's and watching Obi-Wan on Disney+. Plus. That way, Obi-Wan can save the world and I can stay distracted. But we take that posture. If we do that, there's something we lose in our formation as believers. You know, Psalm 34, 18 says, The Lord is close to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. You see, if we bypass that and just say, hey, I just want to be all about the resurrection, we forget that there's also a crucifixion. Before there can be new life, there has to be death. And sometimes we just want the resurrection. We just want the new life, but we got to go back and bury the body. That's really what lament is about. Even when there are seasons of change, maybe you're still not okay. Maybe you're still reeling from the death of a loved one. Maybe it's a parent that's passed away or a family member who's fighting cancer or some sort of terminal disease and everyone else has moved on, but your heart, it's still broken. I've spoken to a few of you who are going through transitions, transitions at work, transitions with your kids. It's different and change is good, but some of it's not so good and you're still kind of reeling from some of that. And Let's get even really honest. Uh, right now, if you're watching this, you know that last week Roger Freed was arrested. And I've had countless conversations and emails with many of you who are expressing shock and outrage and pain and everything in between. And in fact, let me just share with you an email I received about someone who was struggling with this. It says, what is the church should our response be to this? How do we support each other through it? How do we even begin to wrap our heads around this? One person shared that she is struggling with the thought is if this could happen with someone that she knew and loved and trusted, then how can you trust anyone? We live in a broken world and we cannot control the actions of others around us, even those in our circles. Because I want to be clear. Um, if you're watching this uh, later on in the future, there's an issue that we're dealing with. The justice system's working it through. We're praying for justice, for light to come out of this. But even when the charges or allegations are levied against someone that we know, it sends us reeling. It's a reminder that we live in a broken world and that broken world is closer than we would like to think. It's why when we're faced with this raw brokenness in the world, that as Christ followers, we don't deny it. We don't run and post on Facebook. Our first response should be lament. Biblical lament is essentially a prayer of pain. In fact, I know many of you, you know this, 28% of the Psalms are laments. They're Psalms or prayers about how messed up things are. And Lament, it's also a form of protest. They draw attention to injustice and evil and pain all around. Biblical lament even calls out to God to address the pain. They're heartfelt expressions of grief and loss. And you know, laments are found all over the Old Testament. And they usually have three parts to them. The first part is the lament or the expression of grief, loss, anger, or pain. Part two is a petition saying, God, did you see this? Can you fix it? We do something about it. And then third is praise. It's a renewed expression of trust in God, even when the world doesn't make sense. You see, think about lament as a bridge between pain and praise. When you begin in pain and you learn to surrender to God through heartfelt, raw, honest lament, you're actually able to praise God and worship in ways you've never been able to do before. You have a deeper understanding of his grace, his mercy, and his provision. And we can with confidence affirm that God is good, even when the world is not. But listen, you can't fake your way to praise. That's just toxic positivity. You can only lament your way there. And it's fitting that lament 
is poetry. Because you know this? When you're in pain, what do most of us do? We turn to music, right? We find a worship song or a song that resonates with us. In fact, I really saw this really uh, come to light in this past season of Stranger Things. Anyone watch Stranger Things? Okay, a couple of you do. Some of you are like, don't judge me. <laughs> Listen, it's not a family show. Don't watch it with your kids. Um, but if you don't know what Stranger Things is, it's a show on Netflix. It takes place in the 80s. And it's about this group of kids that has this encounter with this other world called the Upside Down. And they're fighting these dark forces. I'll be honest. I literally watch this because it triggers all of my 80s nostalgia. I just love it. And uh, there's this one character. Her name is Max. And Max is a high school girl. And she lost her brother. And she saw him die. And it was super traumatic. But she's been telling her friends, guys, I'm fine. She's telling her counselor, I'm fine. Her parents, I'm fine. But yet she's incredible, incredible pain. And one of the ways that she's been dealing with her pain is she listens to her walkman to this one song by Katie Bush called Running Up That Hill. The lyrics go like this. If only I could, I'd make a deal with God and get him to swap our places. Be running up that road, be running up that hill, be running up that building. I'm going to stop right there because I'm not a singer. <laughs> but this lyric, this song expresses what Max has been feeling in ways that she probably couldn't put together and share with her friends. You know, she was so traumatized by watching what happened to her brother, by watching her brother die, she wishes she could trade places with him. She feels like it's her fault when it really wasn't. See, this song is, is Max's lament. So today, we're going to look at a poem that will put into words and help you verbalize what you are experiencing and feeling. So we're going to turn to the book of Lamentations. Now, Lamentations is in the Old Testament. It's a short book. If you blink, you'll miss it. It's right after Jeremiah and right before Ezekiel. But before we jump in, let me kind of set the table for us. Lamentations was written as a reflection on one of the most devastating, horrific losses in the history of God's people which was the destruction of Jerusalem in 586 BCE. A long story short, God was in a covenant relationship with Jerusalem, but they kept breaking the covenant by oppressing the poor and marginalized, by um, worshiping other gods, committing all sorts of injustice like idolatry. And while God is slow to anger, eventually he's got to judge evil and wickedness. And that's what he does. He allowed Babylon to come and destroy Jerusalem. So this poem is actually processing God's people they're actually venting what's going on. This is not just a poem. It's actually a work of art. It's what's called an acrostic poem. Every stanza begins with a letter from the Hebrew Bible. This is done to bring structure and order to a moment in the life of God's people that's just confusing and chaotic. So the poet's actually building a bridge of lament in order to praise God in the end. But it's a journey to get there. So we're going to start by looking at chapter 1, by look, looking at certain verses in there. It says this, starts off in verse 1. Jerusalem, once so full of people, is now deserted. She who was once great among the nations now sits alone like a widow. Once the queen of all the earth, she is now a slave. She sobs through the night. Tears stream down her cheeks. Among all her lovers, there is no one left to comfort her. All her friends have betrayed her and become her enemies. So when this poem starts, the narrator, most likely the prophet Jeremiah, is describing the situation that God's people in Jerusalem are in. What we see is that God's people, Jerusalem, they were once this powerful and prosperous nation. In fact, that little phrase, great among the nations, mean they were actually an economic powerhouse. They were financially doing great. And then all of a sudden, things fall apart. The world that they once knew has collapsed because of this Babylonian invasion. The poem goes on to say, Judah has been led away into captivity, oppressed with cruel slavery. She lives among foreign nations and has no place of rest. Her enemies have chased her down and she has nowhere to go. By the way, she is a reference to Jerusalem. So what does exactly this mean? See, this is actually complete and utter devastation. You see, Babylon has a scorched earth policy when they conquer another nation. They destroy everything, buildings, roads, animals, people. And not just killing everyone, they actually want to destroy the culture. So what they do is they take the best and the brightest into exile, back into Babylon, so they can be assimilated, so they'd be no longer Jews, they'd be Babylonians. And you have to understand that God had promised the people land. The land for the people represents security, identity, family, and future. So when these things are removed, when the people are removed from their homeland, when their temple is destroyed, they feel insecurity. They, they feel like everything is destroyed, gone. Their world is turned upside down, in a sense. So, 
there is bitter, bitter weeping. And while this poem is describing the situation of Jerusalem symbolized by a woman who has been assaulted, she speaks and says, O Lord, look, she mourns, and see how I am despised. Now, I want you to notice something here in this verse. We start with a narrator who's kind of looking at it from a third person objective perspective. Now, all of a sudden, we are seeing the perspective of Jerusalem as a woman. And the reason is she's trying to convey that this is personal. This isn't something that's out there. It's not something that you can be distracted from or sanitized. It's happening right here. She says, does it mean nothing to you? All you who pass by, look around. See if there's any suffering like mine, which the Lord brought on me when he erupted in fierce anger. So this woman has a voice. And her voice she's using, she's crying out, she's blaming God. She's like, God, how could you do this to me? How could you allow this to happen? And then she's looking around at everyone else. Don't you see what happened? Don't you see my pain? Don't you see what I'm going through? She makes a powerful and a vulnerable admission. In verse 14, she says this, He, meaning God, you wove my sins into ropes to hitch me to a yoke of captivity. Meaning this, God, my sins have led to this. She, she's actually acknowledging her sin. See, when you lament, sometimes you can admit that bad things have happened to you. Sometimes you're the reason why that has happened. But sometimes it's because of what's happened around you. But I want to clarify something about when we talk about sin in the Bible and in Lamentations. See, we can sin against God and also sin against one another. And usually when someone sins against us, the gospel calls us to forgive them the way God has forgiven us, right? But when we talk about forgiveness, there's a concept that often gets forgotten because our English translations don't fully know how to capture all of the nuances in, in this. And this is why I'm really grateful for the global church, especially Korean translations and Korean theologians. Korean theologian Andrew Park talks about the concept of Han as part of sin. Han is the Korean concept of suffering and sorrow in the aftermath of being sinned against. So this is not just forgiving the person who has sinned against you, but then if you're the victim, how do you find healing from your sin? And I think this is really a missing piece when we talk about sin in the American church. Let's get pro practical here. If you're an educator or a teacher or a pastor, you have a certain uh, sense of social capital or, or an obligation to the community. Uh, and when you break that trust, when you um, use your, 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 your situation to hurt other people, it's a betrayal. It's a breach of trust, and it's a death. Uh, you know, this past week I called a lot of the parents who have kids in fourth to sixth grade to ask if they've seen anything, and they said, Nathan, this has been hard because I've had to have a conversation with my kid, which in many ways was, a, was the death of their innocence. Because when a trust is broken in a community, you know what we can do? We, we, the authorities can fire the person. Uh, they can get involved, arrest them, and put them in jail and all these other things. We can even forgive them, right? When we know that's what the Bible calls us to do, is to forgive. But there's another piece of sin that sometimes gets left out, and it's this residue that gets left. It's this thing called Han. Because in the aftermath of sin, there is still devastation there. There's trust that has, hasn't been rebuilt. Our sense of community it hasn't been repaired. And our sense of safety it hasn't been restored. Lament isn't learning to be more emo like My Chemical Romance. It's, it's not learning how to cry better. Lament is our way to express our grief and loss. But when we lament, we're also called to name the very thing that is wrong in the world. We are called to name what is out of order in our society, in our culture. We name the things that get in the way of human flourishing. One of the functions of lament is protest. You can't fix what you can't see. But we also need to realize that there's work of healing that needs to take place. And, and before we start to jump in and try to fix things and repair what's broken, we actually need to be healed. And that's what lament does. So when we lament, we need to keep two things in mind. The first is this. Biblical spirituality is always honest about your experiences. You know, I had a friend in college who, she was dating this guy, and they had been dating from high school. They actually went from the same high school to the same college. They were dating in that college. They had the same major. They planned to get married when they graduated. It was this whole big thing. And suddenly he broke it off. Ended up uh, hooking up with another girl. It was really devastating to our friend. So that night, we went to go meet up with her to see how she was doing. And 
She comes to the door, big smile on her face. She goes, hey guys, how you doing? Hey, I thought it'd be great if we would sing some worship songs. I really just love God. You know, I know that this, this thing is not a big deal and God's got, got this. And so I just want to worship him. The truth is, guys, we were all weirded out by that. <laughs> we were like, this is not a normal response. And listen, yeah, we know that God can bring good out of bad situations, but in the midst of a bad situation, we got to feel it. See, my friend did two things that you and I have to avoid. She did this. She was spiritualizing and minimizing. Now listen, I believe that everything has a spiritual component for sure. But when we spiritualize our pain and loss, what we're essentially saying is, well, you know, if I'm a Christian, I'm never going to suffer. Everything's going to be okay. Suffering's not going to have any impact on me. But guys, that's just not true. Guys, it's true that, yeah, God is going to be with you, but he's also going to be with you when you suffer. He's not going to, he's going to allow suffering to come your way. He doesn't want you to ignore your pain or your losses. It's part of being in a broken world. Nor does God want you to minimize your pain. You know, when you minimize your pain or loss, we simply pretend it's not a big deal. Oh, yeah, my girlfriend broke up with me, but that's not bad. That's not as bad because, you know, Jerry lost his dad to cancer. That's much worse. Guys, this... This isn't like the pain Olympics. We shouldn't go around comparing whose pain is worse than others. Your pain is your pain. Don't minimize it. Don't spiritualize it. Just own it. Own your pain. Own your hurt. Lament doesn't spiritualize or minimize things. Lament doesn't deny reality, but it embraces it. The second thing I want you to keep in mind is this, is that when grief is unexpressed, your body, mind, and soul is distressed. Maybe you've heard this saying, I think there's actually a book title, that the body keeps score. If you push down and repress your feelings of anger, of depression, of sadness, anxiety, it's going to leak and it's going to come out in other ways and it's going to poison your relationships. Relationships with your spouse, relationships with your kids, your job, it can even damage your health. You know, there's a difference between the American or the Western world and how we grieve the dead or have a funeral and the Middle East. You know, in our country, if someone dies, you know, it's in a funeral home or a church, there's nice neat rows, everyone takes a seat. Um, people like, you know, they may dab a tear or two, something like that. Uh, sometimes people even apologize for getting emotional at, at a funeral, which is like bonkers to me. But if you go to a funeral in the Middle East or the Near East, you can see people carrying a coffin all throughout town. People are screaming and they're wailing. Some of them are throwing themselves on the coffin. Uh, and this is an event that lasts for days. They grieve with their full body. They grieve with their minds and their souls. You see, I think as a culture, we don't know how to handle grief or loss or even death. And sometimes we don't even realize we try to sanitize it and ignore it. And sometimes we don't even know what to do with it until something happens publicly. You know, over the past few years, there have been a bunch of celebrities that have died. And, and oddly enough, um, people sometimes get emotional with those deaths. Like, I remember I heard about Dustin Diamond. You guys ever heard of Dustin Diamond? He, was, he played Screech on Saved by the Bell. Well, listen, I hadn't thought about him in, like, years and years and years. But I remember when I heard that he died, I got really emotional. Like, has that ever happened to you? Like, when a celebrity, maybe it's Prince... Uh, maybe it's like someone recent and, and all of a sudden you start getting emotional about it. Like, why is it? Like, why does it happen? It's like, I haven't heard of this person in years. Well, part of it's nostalgia for sure. But you know what the other part is? I think because we have so much pent up loss and pain and grief that when something happens publicly, it feels like we have permission to let ourselves feel. So how do we, from a biblical perspective, lament? How do we build this bridge from pain to praise? I want to share with you three ways. The first is this, is you have to normalize pain and loss. Here's what I know right now. Right now you're watching this video and you fall into one of three groups. The first group is you have never really experienced any pain or loss in life. For you, you have the t-shirt, everything is awesome. And I hope that stays that way, but at some point you're going to experience pain and loss, or you know someone right now who's in the second group. That second group of people is you are going through pain and loss right now. Maybe it's blindsided you, you're experiencing some hurt, some loss and pain, and that's kind of where you're at, or you're part of the third group. You're actually coming out of the season of pain and loss, and you're going to be able to use that pain and loss to help other people, because God doesn't waste our pain. So here's the thing. I want to remind you that everyone here that's watching this, you're in one of those three groups. And so I want to prepare you because maybe some of you are like, oh, Pastor Nathan, thanks for that. That's really encouraging for my summer. 
But here's the thing. Change is a part of life. Jeremiah reflects this in verse 1 where he says, Jerusalem, once so full of people, is now deserted. She who was once great among the nations now sits alone like a widow. Once the queen of all the earth, she is now a slave. Guys, Jerusalem was once the bee's knees. Not anymore. She's deserted, alone, and a slave. We have examples of this in our society all the time, don't we? Like, maybe our lament would be the mall was once so full of people. The Best Buy was great among Lycoming County. <laughs> now sits alone in ruins. Kodak Film was once the queen of all the earth. The truth is, change is constant. With change comes loss. With loss comes pain. And it could be the loss of your job, the loss of a relationship, the loss of a community trust, the loss of a parent, even the loss of little things like your favorite restaurant closes down or Best Buy goes away. And while we may be tempted to minimize our pain, it's not a big deal, it's not that bad, don't compare. Just realize that your pain and loss, it's normal on this side of eternity. We are always experience pain and loss. And then when that happens, you can intentionally pause in your pain. See, our culture, we don't know what to do with pain. We've either been taught to tough it out, grind it out, grin and bear it, or just let your pain define you. It makes you hard and cynical. And, and that's why we get so busy, right? If we're busy, we never have to pause, slow down, and actually engage with our pain or our hurt. But if we do that and hit the pause button, all that regret and pain comes to the surface. You know, I, I got to admit, um, if you know what the Enneagram is, I'm a seven. So that means like I love everything that's happy. I want to avoid pain. I want to avoid difficult situations. I'm all about what's going to be fun. But years ago, I learned that I need to build the emotional muscle to deal with the hard things in life. And I did that through lament. See, when you pause, you actually name your pain. You can actually say, am I suffering this pain because of sin I've committed? Have I been sinned against? Is this a wound that needs to be healed? Is, is it pausing to grieve, you know, even something as simple as, I'm pausing to grieve a, a Facebook memory that just came up of my, of my kid five years ago, and they're singing in a VBS, and man, they've grown so much, and the years have gone so fast. So you pause and just let ourselves be in that moment. This is one of the reasons why I journal on a regular basis. I need to get that pain out on the page and you get out those feelings. Or I talk with a trusted friend or I share in my city group. Or guys, a counselor. Guys, seasons of counseling has been a gift in this time to identify my pain. And sometimes what I found with my counselors is like there's layers upon layers of pain. Like, there's pain that's built on another layer. This is so important to identify and name our pain. That's why in verse 16 it says, For all these things I weep. Tears flow down my cheeks. No one is here to comfort me. No one who might encourage me are far away. My children have no future, for the enemy has conquered us. See, the grief of identifying the enemy, identifying no comfort, my children have no future. And at this point, Jeremiah is not suggesting solutions. He's not saying, here's how you fix it. He's pausing in the pain. He's naming it. He's protesting it. And finally, we come to the third insight, which is this. You need to, you need to post your pain on Facebook. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. That's not what it says. You need to pray your pain to God. See, in the poem, the woman who personifies Jerusalem says, Lord, see my anguish? My heart is broken and my soul despairs, for I have rebelled against you. In the streets, the sword kills, and at home, there's only death. Others heard my groans, but no one turned to comfort me. When my enemies heard about my troubles, they were happy to see what you had done. Oh, bring the day you promised when, you will, when they will suffer as I have suffered. Now, you read this verse, maybe you're tracking it, and then you're like, well, wait a minute, Nathan. This verse isn't theologically correct. You see, we have to love our enemies and pray for those who persecute us. That's what Jesus taught. Is the Bible contradicting itself? So, so it's not, but here's what you've got to understand. Remember, biblical spirituality is honest about our experiences. So before you post your anger and your sorrow or your hurt on Facebook, you've got to get face-to-face -face with Jesus. When you're face-to-face -face with Jesus, you pour out your anger and your sorrow and your confusion and your heartbreak 
just like Jerusalem did here. You share what you're feeling. You can confess desperation. You can confess your sin. You can also complain about how unfair things are. You can pour it out in prayer to Jesus because the truth is pain and loss is part of life on earth. It's it's how we respond to brokenness all around us. So here's the question I want to leave you with today. You can take a screen capture of this, whatever you need to do. It's this question. What has been taken away from you this season? What has been taken away from you this season? Can I get a little honest with you and share what I feel has been taken away from this season? Uh, we moved about a year ago to Williamsport. But some of the, the lament is there have been friendships I've had for decades that have changed because we've moved. There is a new weight of responsibility that I'm bearing going from being an associate pastor to a lead pastor. Uh, I am watching my kids grow up faster than I can even process or even keep up with. So I lament those things because it's a bridge. I'm trying to bridge between my pain and praise. And maybe you're watching this video right now I don't feel like praising God. Maybe it's been too long before you could actually praise God. And I just want to say that's okay. You don't have to feel it to believe it. You just have to trust and believe before you feel it. You can choose to worship. You can enter into that space. In fact, when you do that, it'll be a conscious choice to raise your hands and worship and surrender. But maybe you're not ready for that yet. That's okay. Because you can still choose to give God praise even in your pain when you lament. Let me pray for you. Lord, I want to pray for the person watching this video right now who's struggling with loss. They're struggling with pain. They're looking at the world around them and they don't understand how a good God can allow so much evil, pain, and suffering in this world. God, I'll be honest, I have that question a lot. I, I don't have an answer for that. And honestly, I don't know if there's any good answers on this side of eternity. So God, I pray for us that you would teach us to lament. Teach us to normalize pain and loss. Teach us how to pause when we feel it and sense it. And teach us to pray it to you before we post it on social media. Because we need you to intervene, to help us, to change us from the inside out. In your son's name we pray. Amen. Hey guys, thank you so much for watching today's message. I hope it spoke to you and it inspired you. Go ahead and hit the subscribe button. That way you can stay up to date on all of our latest messages here at City Alliance Church. And if you want to partner with us to take the gospel here, there, and everywhere, go ahead and hit the give button. Your faithful tithes and offerings help us reach more people with the good news of Jesus Christ.